All right, if you have your Bibles with you, go ahead and open to Psalms chapter 46. I'm going to be reading from Psalms 46 and 50. You'll have to forgive the uh, timber of my voice. I have a bit of a sore throat today. Psalm 46, it opens, God is our strong refuge. He is truly our helper in times of trouble. This is a psalm that is about people being against us. And in this case, it's armies fighting one another. And we're kind of used to this idea that the psalms are about the problems of kings. And sometimes it's easy to think of them as being detached from the problems of normal people. But in the ancient world, wars were common, and the problems of normal people were the problems of war. And even today, there is always a time where two nations are at war. And when you're the people that are caught in the middle of that, it's reassuring to know that God knows your struggles, God knows what you're going through, and that God is still looking out for you. The Psalm, psalmist goes on to say, For this reason we do not fear when the earth shakes and the mountains tremble, excuse me, and the mountains tumble into the depths of the sea, when its waves crash and foam and the mountains shake before the surging sea. It sounds like the war is an act of God, but really isn't it contrasting it with acts of God? The fact is, no war has ever scaled to the point of being greater than even a single act of God. Our God is still in control of this world. He looks out for his people and he will protect us. And even if he doesn't, as said Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego before they were thrown into the fiery furnace, even if he doesn't, we will still serve him because he's God. And what happened to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the book of Daniel? They found the Lord in the furnace. And they were preserved. Because this is how God works. It says in verse 4, the river's channel bring joy to the city of God. See, those forces that God unleashes upon the world are creative forces. They're bringing about new life. The special holy dwelling place of the Most High. God lives within it. It cannot be moved. God rescues it at the break of dawn. Now we get the second part of the psalm. The part that is often so very violent. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms are overthrown. God gives a shout and the earth dissolves. The Lord of heaven's armies is on our side. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Come witness the exploits of the Lord who brings devastation to the earth. He brings an end to wars throughout the earth. He shatters the bow and breaks the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, stop your striving and recognize that I am God. I will be exalted over the nations. I will be exalted over the earth. All these things God is doing is to get our attention because we have forgotten what's important. 
We are fighting with one another and we forget that it is our job to bring glory to God. That it is our job to take care of this earth he has created, this earth which nurtures us and brings us joy. Well, that, that can be a great message for when you're in the midst of strife, but what about those in our congregation who aren't well? What about those who are hurting for reasons that have nothing to do with conflict. Turn with me to Psalm chapter 50. And here it says, El Elohim Adonai. God, the Lord God, has spoken and summoned the earth to come from the east and west, from Zion, the most beautiful of all places, God has come in splendor. May our God come and not be silent. Consuming fire goes ahead of him, and all around him a storm rages. Note that even though I, I just read a very violent psalm, this psalm, what, what is the purpose of this violence? It's to get our attention. Notice that no one is being harmed by the consuming fire or the storm that rages. But it does make a lot of noise, doesn't it? He summons the heavens above as well as the earth so that he might judge his people. He says, Assemble my covenant people before me, those who ratified a covenant with me by sacrifice. The heavens declare his fairness, for God is judge. What kind of God do we serve? How will we be judged? The heavens declare his fairness, the psalmist tells us. But in the book of John, we're assured that our God is love. This is not the judgment of some detached observer. This is the judgment of a parent. And he says, listen, my people, I am speaking. Listen, Israel, I am accusing you. I am God, your God. I am not condemning you because of your sacrifices or because of your burnt sacrifices that you continually offer me. I do not need to take a bull from your household or goats from your sheepfolds. For every wild animal in the forest belongs to me, as well as the cattle that graze on a thousand hills. I keep track of every bird in the hills, and the insects of the field are mine. Even if I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world and all it contains belong to me. Does God need anything that we have? No. Our God is greater than anything we can imagine anything that we can perceive, all the world and all of our problems. He's bigger than all of it. And yet he calls on us. He calls on us to be his people, to be his children. This God that transcends everything we know has called each and every one of us as Christians to be his children. He says, present to God a thank offering. Repay your vows to the Most High. Pray to me when you are in trouble. I will deliver you and you will honor me. Just like the fire and the storm, God is asking for our attention. He is asking us to pray to him. He is asking us to cast our cares on him and give thanks to him. God says this to the evildoer. Now, <clears throat> when we get to this point in the psalm, it's a good reminder that Hebrew poetry is always arranged in two parts. 
in a couple different ways. You'll notice that the two lines, that it's always arranged in couplets, two lines that repeat one another. All right, so you got two lines, two lines, two lines, two lines, and they all, one repeats right after the other. But then it's also split into two halves. The first half, which gives glory and praise to God, and the second half that casts upon God our troubles. And it's the second half that we've gotten to now in verse, excuse me, in, in verse 15. I'm sorry, 16. God says this to the evildoer. Now we come to this point where we are casting our cares on God because we have been persecuted by the evildoer in this case. He says, how can you declare my commands and talk about my covenant? For you hate instruction and reject my words. When you see a thief, you join him. You associate with men who are unfaithful to their wives. You do damage with words and use your tongue to deceive. You plot against your brother and slander your own brother. When you did these things, I was silent, so you thought I was exactly like you. But now I will condemn you and state my case against you. Carefully consider this, you who reject God. Otherwise, ooh, that's quite violent. I'll leave that out. <sighs> whoever presents a thank offering honors me. To whoever obeys my commands, I will reveal my power to deliver. And that last line is the point, isn't it? You see, sometimes our problems come from within, sometimes they come from without. And the Psalms show us how these things are always connected. But notice that even when God in this Psalm is addressing the evildoer, he's addressing him to turn away from his evil ways. It is always a call to return to God, even though sometimes it's expressed in such violent imagery. But I think, I think there are some who really only understand violent imagery. But God is calling on each and every one of us, those who are hurting, And those who are persecuted, those whose circumstances are oppressed, and those who are hurting of no fault of their own. Turn to the Lord in prayer, because God is on our side. And it's so very easy to forget that we have a friend. So brothers and sisters, turn to one another. Turn to one another when you are in need. Come together and pray and remember that the Lord is with you and that he will be with us always.